And welcome again, everyone, to this third day of the FT's Global Boardroom event. We are delighted to welcome to this Tech Asia keynote interview, Audrey Tang, Taiwan's Minister in Charge of Social Innovation. Audrey is well known uh, as a luminary in their field for famous, um, uh, famous for spearheading a vision of open government in Taiwan, which we will hear about more in a couple of minutes. In the public sector, Minister Tang served on Taiwan's National Development Council's Open Data Committee and the 12-year Basic Education Curriculum Committee and led the country's first e-rulemaking project. Uh, in the private sector, Minister Tang worked as a consultant with Apple on computational linguistics, uh, with Oxford University Press on cloud lexicography, and with social text on social interaction design. And in the social sector, Audrey, actively contributes to GovZero, a vibrant community focusing on creating tools for civil society uh, with the call to fork the government. So, um, Minister Tang, a warm welcome. And uh, just to start with, I wonder if you could recount a little bit of the saga of the mask maps in Taiwan. Uh, I think some people will be uh, familiar with this. But in essence, I think this initiative in which you were a prime mover is seen as an example of open government and open data. And it helped get Taiwan ahead of the pandemic in the very early days when the virus was spreading. And me based in Taiwan was you know, wondering what, what, what our fate would be. Could you just explain what happened at that time, please? Certainly. So um, last February, uh, early February, when we discovered that the R value uh, of the new variant of SARS um, is quite high and without more than three quarters of people wearing masks uh, properly, we wouldn't be able to solve it using contact tracing alone. Uh, we decided to start rationing out masks because at the time in a country of 23 million, our mask production at the time was uh, less than 2 million per day. So it means that uh, if we do not ration out the mask, then uh, people would hold the mask and it will not protect anyone. But even before we roll out this rationing method, uh, the civic tech community, GovZero, as you just mentioned, the G0V community, uh, came up with their own idea of visualizing the mask availability in the nearby pharmacies and stores and so on, so that people queuing in line do not have to queue in vain and can uh, distribute among themselves uh, to the place that still have some mask available. So the mask rationing map uh, is a what I call people-public-private partnership, where the people who came up with this idea of a visualizing map, and we do a kind of reverse procurement. So early February, in a time span of three days, uh, we started providing the kind of real-time open API, <clears throat> updated every 30 seconds, so that when you queue in line, you don't have to wait for the person queuing before you to update uh, their numbers on the map, which is what the civic tech originally did. Uh, but actually a pharmacy, which more than 90% have a fiber optic line back to the National Health um, Insurance Administration. So you can buy some mask and immediately after 30 seconds, it's like a distributed ledger, more than 100 different uh, tools, including chatbots, maps, voice assistants for the uh, seeing uh, difficult people and so when all gets updated in real time. So first people trust this system as a distributed ledger. So people can see it's being rationed out rather effectively. And second, of course, one does not have to queue in vain. And the OpenStreetMap community, for example, can also co-create better distribution and pre-registration algorithms because everybody can analyze the data, including the bias independently. So indeed, it is a kind of shiny case of how real-time open 
data helped to counter the pandemic. And by April, by May last year, we're uh, largely gone to zero COVID and stayed that way for a very long time. But this May, of course, when the alpha and later on delta variant uh, hit Taiwan, we face our real first and only wave. And so it's the same bunch of people who co-create a Musk uh, rationing map also created a SMS-based contact tracing tool. Uh, and it's not like in other countries where the data is aggregated to the state, like making a surveillance state, but neither are we kind of um, trusting solely the uh, Google and Apples of the world, the multinational companies from coming up with their exposure notification app. Uh, the third way is having the civic society, civil society, creating the tool based on open standards, in this case, SMS and QR code. So you don't have to download any app, just your built-in phone, your building camera, Camera, point QA venues QR code and it pops up automatically SMS pre-composed with the 15 random codes uh, uh, representing the venue that you just hit send. So everyone uh, can check in in just a couple of seconds and within a week, uh, basically we adopted this design from the GovZero community and more than 2 million venues began printing those QR codes. And to date, there's more than one quarter billion SMS sent this way that reduced the contact tracing time it uh, takes for each infected case from uh, 24 hours to less than 24 minutes uh, automatically. And that's why for more than one month now, we're back to zero COVID. Wow, fascinating. Just just, just a, a point on that to clarify. So, so does that rely on the individual that has got COVID to report the, the fact that they have been infected, infected? Does it rely on that? So basically the way it works is that the SMS that representing the check-in is stored in the uh, telecom operator of your choice, right? So whomever uh, hands you the SIM card stores that check-in for 28 days. And if in the same venue, there's anyone uh, confirmed as being infected, then uh, it is the contact tracers uh, that then use this um, platform to notify uh, automatically uh, all the people who have checked into the same venue. It doesn't need to be a static venue, it could be a same taxi or things like that so they can get the exposure notifications. And if uh, the contact tracer finds out uh, who exactly is in the same venue and so on, then of course uh, the contact tracer can proactively notice the persons uh, and uh, put them in quarantine and so on. And so this is uh, both proactive, but also has a passive mode as well. But if there's no uh, case in the 28 uh, days in any given venue, then the telecom company just rotates, deletes, the check-in records and the contact tracer never uh, access that deleted uh, records. So uh, to date, uh, there's only been, I think, around um, 10 million or so, 12 million or so accesses to the check-in records. So the vast majority of the quarter billion were just deleted with no privacy compromises. Right. Fascinating. It's really a, a world leading example, I think. Um, but but more broadly in Taiwan, I mean, we, we know that uh, Taiwan's government has been a leader globally in open government and uh, you have a national action plan in this regard. Could you just explain, you know, what are the main aims of the plan and and what are the main uh, steps so far? Definitely. So the open data part uh, is the transparency pillar uh, of the Open Government National Action Plan, which uh, runs the same length as uh, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen's uh, second uh, presidential term. So we still have a couple years more uh, to implement uh, more open data when it comes especially on environmental data, climate sensing, air pollution sensing, and so on. And uh, the other pillar is the participation uh, pillar, which uh, calls for not just uh, increasing the bandwidth of the democracy as in, as I said, open data, but also reduce the latency, meaning that people do not have to wait for four years uh, to vote, uh, but rather continuously every day, uh, there's a uh, e-petition platform going called Join, uh, and people can set their own agenda after collecting 5,000 signatures, the ministries, and including interagency issues, uh, twice every month, so we meet face-to-face -face with those uh, petitioners and multi-stakeholders to figure out how we can work together. And the same electronic um, signature um, 
infrastructure also extends next year. We'll start to do joint e-signatures for our national level referendum. So not just the administration level, but also binding to the legislation level as well as part of our referendum work. And also we're committed to uh, be inclusive. So including people who are not uh, even 18 years old can still set uh, the agenda through the uh, Youth Advisory Council, what we call the reverse mentor uh, to the cabinet, as well as uh, starting their own petitions on, for example, banning the plastic straws of our bubble tea takeouts and things like that. So it's not just to make uh, the entire administration more transparent and accountable, but also make the decision-making process more participatory and inclusive. Right. Um, it's uh, so I, I understand. So basically, if 5000 people get together and they have a proposal for the government, then the government is duty bound to consider that proposal. Is, is, is that the way? That's correct. Uh, and we have a dedicated system called participation officers or POs embedded in all 32 ministries in charge of engaging the public. For example, in 2017, uh, when a service designer uh, named Zuo Zhiyuan uh, petitioned uh, that the tax filing experience is horrible, uh, ex and I quote, explosively hostile to taxpayers, end of quote, uh, then uh, it's not just this negative energy of them demonstrating against, but rather the participation officer engaged him uh, immediately and said, let's co-create next year's tax filing experience together with the people who feel the most uh, anger right, about this particular issue. There's a real sense of urgency there. But uh, I think a very creative thing of the PO network when it comes to the joint platform petitions is that the breakout groups were not facilitated by the tax agency, but instead by the coastal guard, for example. But when we deliver about the uh, facing the ocean um, kind of uh, ideas of surfing, amateur fishing, and things like that, then maybe it's the tax agency or the financial ministry's participation officer uh, facilitating the breakout groups. And the theory is that once they're outside of the silo, uh, the tax collector also surfs in their spare time, and the coastal guard probably files the tax themselves too. Uh, so they take automatically the position of the citizens and can work on true kind of mutual policy because they feel the need of citizens themselves. It's, uh, it's really an interesting initiative. I imagine there are plenty of countries around the world where people feel anger when they have to file their taxes and, uh, and they, um, you know, cooperation with an authority to make that process easier is surely something that I, well, I personally feel the UK could, uh, could learn from. Um, uh, just on a different topic, though, um, I know that you have been involved with the issue of misinformation and toxic commentaries um, uh, in social media and in, in, in other places. Could you explain what you're doing in, in that regard? Certainly. So um, Taiwan's way to counter the disinformation is not via takedowns. We don't take down anything from the administration, but rather on investing in public infrastructures, pro-social social media in the digital realm. That is to say, for example, the PTT, uh, which is the forum like Reddit, but free of advertisers or shareholders, is squarely in the social sector for the past almost three decades now, funded by the Taiwan Academia Network. And that's the place when uh, Dr. Li Wenliang's message spread to Taiwan uh, 2019 December that there are, and I quote, seven SARS cases in the Huanan Sifu market, end of quote, got triaged overnight in 24 hours. It resulted in us getting the health inspection for all five passengers coming in from Wuhan to Taiwan. And that shows a pro-social social media, a digital equivalent of a town hall, can really contribute to early discovery and response uh, when it comes to pandemic and other uh, urgent issues. Issues. And then the joint platform, again, is a uh, investment uh, by the public administration in the National Development Council. So starting 2016, basically, we classify such investment in the public infrastructure, in the digital realm, uh, infrastructure money. This is a previously things made out of concrete, like concrete buildings, uh, are can now be made in bits. And then we have the digital equivalent for the citizens to have a pro-social conversation. But of course, the digital equivalent of nightclubs, there's two 
say Facebook and so on with loud music, smoke filled room and private bounces. Of course, these are still around. There's a lot of conversation going on there, but there by and large, we use the idea of humor over rumor, making sure that any trending disinformation as discovered uh, by the journalists, the fact checkers, the GovZero people, the COVAX project uh, meets in just a couple hours, a very comedic response uh, from the participation office uh, from each ministries so that people can just laugh about it, laugh the tension off and then focus on the policy, not the outrage. How do you uh, deal with the issue of opinion? I mean, if somebody has an opinion that you believe is based on faulty information, how do you deal with that? Because I think in many societies, people would say, well, that's my right. You know, I, I feel that way. And uh, I, my interpretation of the reality is this. Yours may be different. So how do you deal with that? Yeah, we uh, use a method called notice and public notice. Uh, indeed, as you said, uh, if they read something that has been manipulated, but think that's the fact, that's the truth. If you take it down, if you uh, impose some top down fines or something, then actually it fuels the outrage, right? it fuels the conspiracy theories, It actually make the matter worse and more polarized. Uh, but especially leading up to election, that's when those conspiracy theory are in their kind of full uh, height. Uh, but in Taiwan, what we did is basically the contact trade idea uh, applied to the disinformation, kind of like a virus of the mind. So we invite, for example, the middle schoolers to fact check the three presidential candidates during their uh, debate and forums and so on. And uh, it's not just a, a classroom assignment or exercise. They, along with anyone who want to contribute, once they discover something that doesn't match, uh, can actually contribute to the live stream when the debate was still happening. So making a positive impact uh, to the entire conversation. And during the tallying, for example, the, because we use paper-based ballots for presidential elections and mayor elections, uh, when people start this counting process, they show the paper to the YouTubers in the audience. And there's dedicated apps uh, in each major party that does the tallying concurrently from multiple angles. So basically, this is a way to make sure that anything that is a uh, disinformation is met with participatory audit that uh, that particular person can trust a YouTuber that's more aligned to their political affiliation to actually dispel the rumor about the miscounting and things like that. And maybe next round, they will participate in the fact-checking work themselves. Right. Okay. Very interesting. We've got some really good questions that have come in from the audience. So uh, perhaps I could take them one by one. We've got about eight minutes left, so uh, have to be fairly brief. But um, uh, the first one is, are you concerned about the dominance of big platforms like Google on the internet? Yeah, as I mentioned, um, the ideas of civic technology, like based on SMS, contact tracing, QR codes, and so on, is based on the idea that the local norm, the, what's considered normal in the cyberspace, is co-created with the entire society. So, for example, what's the right balance uh, between the right to know that a contact tracer has access to your data and your voluntary contribution, because you can always go back to pen and paper. We never say that's um, out of the question. Question, right? It's a voluntary choice. So the idea is to build such data coalitions, those partnerships with the people, not just for the people. And once people uh, understand that the norm around contact tracing or about mask rationing, of course, we welcome uh, Google, who um, very graciously uh, waived the Google map fees of the initial uh, map rationing um, of the mask prototype. Uh, and they also contribute a lot of the design uh, into uh, the contact tracing tools, including the line uh, instant messenger uh, in Taiwan. Uh, they actually adjusted their QR code scanner of adding friends is like a WhatsApp uh, in Taiwan uh, to support a contact tracing effort. But what's important in people public private partnership is that the norm is not set by those large companies. Uh, they actually just implement the local norm as set by the civic tech community along with the people. Right. Excellent. Um, the next question is, is related, I believe, but I, I, it, it's, it's still very interesting. How does the Web 3.0 initiative by which this question of means the decentralization of the internet uh, fit with your vision of open data and open governance? 
Yeah, uh, I think Web3, uh, with its call to bring code to data rather than aggregate data to code, uh, works very well. And indeed, uh, I'm working with uh, Vitalik Buterin as a fellow board member in Radical Exchange to explore what kind of uh, blockchain-inspired governance, Web3-inspired governance can be applied in Taiwan. So, for example, our presidential hackathon, where every year five social innovation teams are blessed by the president uh, to become a presidential promise for the next fiscal year with all the budget regulation and personnel uh, requirement fulfilled by the state. Uh, that uh, got from the blockchain governance, the idea of quadratic voting. For the past three years, we used this new voting method to uh, unlock more signal around synergies and things like that. And that's something that we learned directly from the decentralized uh, governance uh, community. And uh, SMS-based contact tracing by storing uh, the mapping between the venue code and the venue in one place, and then the check-in, the SMS records in various different telecom companies. The end result is the telecom knows nothing about which venue you have been to, and the venue owner knows nothing about your phone number or indeed anything about you. Uh, and so this, uh, what we call multi-party design, again, is a key part of the federated architecture of the modern Web3 imaginations. So I think it continues to be an inspiration and we will uh, continue to work on the zero knowledge, on the homomorphic encryption, uh, differential privacy, federated learning, and all those great uh, privacy enhancing technology that affirms the democracy uh, ideals that's shared with the Web3 community. Interesting. Um, the, uh, the, there's a couple of questions come in. You just mentioned blockchain. I, I would also be fascinated to know your views on blockchain and crypto. Um, mm -hmm. With the background, of course, that quite a few countries are restricting uh, crypto in some of its uh, iterations. What's mm -hmm. the view? You, what, what's your view personally? What's the view of Taiwan? As I mentioned, uh, I think it's like a research arm which provides the inspiration of decentralized governance uh, for us uh, to work with, uh, but not uh, for right, uh, the people. So I think this is, uh, we have great partnerships with the blockchain communities. Now, uh, mostly uh, we use the distributed ledger ideas, for example, for mask rationing, the 100 different uh, application developers maintaining their own ledger along with crowd audited um, um, input uh, that is directly from the ledger like technology although it's not technically speaking a blockchain or for example last year when people uh, decide they don't uh, want to collect the ration mass for a couple of weeks because maybe they have some spare uh, they can actually use a kind of data sovereignty tool the national health insurance app nhi express uh, to say that the ration that i did not collect i would like to dedicate it to to international humanitarian aid and provide a signal to foreign service, either anonymously or mint a NFT, right? Non-fungibly uh, say that this particular person has dedicated this number of masks. So a lot of people um, contributed charitably. Uh, I think more than 7 million uh, masks uh, initially were distributed this way uh, to around the world. And again, this is uh, similar to an NFT, although it's not technically run on blockchain technology. Mm. And very quickly, um, in the last two minutes, uh, would you be able to um, answer this one? Uh, what is the state of digitalization at the small and medium enterprise level in Taiwan? And what support is the government providing for digitalization? I know this mm -hmm. is also an issue in Hong Kong where I'm, where I'm based. So what's happening in Taiwan? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, well, this year, for example, we have the T Cloud, the Taiwan Cloud uh, project at tcloud.gov.tw that says if you want to try out uh, any of the digital transformation tools that are cloud based uh, as a small or medium enterprise, then the state subsidizes eighty percent of that money. So you can actually try like uh, five times more than you are originally planned to invest, right? So maybe different payment 
methods, uh, different way of organizing um, your supply chain and things like that, and without incurring a lot of initial capital investment on it. So that's the T Cloud project. And we also have a uh, T for talent, the three T talent transformation training project that match makes uh, the uh, young students who were freshly uh, graduated from undergrad level study uh, and then assign five of them at a time as digital ambassadors to a local SME or a night market community uh, and then work on the theory of change to digitally transform them. So they're not really interns, they're more like reverse mentors that are uh, willing to share their first and experience of getting those digital tools uh, and again stay subsidized so without incurring much cost to the SMEs and we've seen a lot of uptakes especially uh, during our uh, what we call 5,000 quintuple stimulus voucher where more than uh, 4 million people choose to uh, redeem the voucher in an electronic way through mobile payment. Well, Minister Tang, I'm afraid that's all we have time for, but thank you so much for such a, a tour de force. It's really been fascinating listening to all the developments underway in Taiwan, and I'm sure uh, many of the audience will, 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 will take away a lot of this. Uh, it'll be new to a lot of people who are listening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Live long and prosper. Thank you.